أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد I begin in Allah's name, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the one who has given us this life, the Fashioner, the one who puts everything together with incredible perfection and has given us the opportunity to exist due to His infinite mercy because we don't deserve to exist. But now that we do exist, we deserve to serve Him and we deserve to serve Him not because He is in need of serving, but we deserve to serve Him because we are in need of continuity of existence and to reap from His infinite treasuries because we love good things and we despise bad things. We love to live eternally because life is superior to non-existence and the Almighty in His infinite mercy has created us as intelligent beings All creations of Allah, including the atomic particles, are intelligent. They have cognition. They have recognition. Allah says, يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Everything that's tasbih of Allah in the heavens and the earth. Whatever is in the heavens, the earth, that's tasbih. And tasbih is not possible unless there's cognition, unless there's intelligence. And we are among those creations that is the most intelligent, not necessarily the intelligent, but one of the most intelligent ones. And it's irrelevant what exists out there. What is relevant is that we exist. And what is around us is sufficient for us to reap the continuity of reaping from the infinite treasuries of God. And that this intelligence that we have been endowed with is the ability by which we are able to recognize the infinite mercy of God. It is through intelligence that we know, but intelligence has the capacity to be taken in the wrong direction as well as in the right direction. And that dichotomy of life is what gives presence to the ability for an individual to live in a relative world, a framed world, a world where there are opposites thesis and antithesis, a world which enables us to be tested because if it's a one-way street and there is no dichotomy, if there is no alternative, then there is no precedence. You and I cannot differentiate each other because we become one block. But what is beautiful about Allah's creation is that every one of us is uniquely individual. We are so individual that it's to the nth level of individuality, and yet we have a commitment in our existence to merge with the universe as one communal society. Once again, you notice the dichotomy where I am an individual, but I also have to merge with my society. Monkery in Islam, which is to run away and worship God, in the mountains for long periods of time is forbidden. Rahbani, as they say, is forbidden in Islam. In Islam, you must indulge with the social environments. You must interact with other human beings. You must interact with the ecosystem. You must interact with the animals. Because that's the trial. And Allah has blessed us with this reality. And this reality of recognition of His mercy comes through trials and tribulations. You might say, how? That's a contradiction. 
Why should I have to be tried with tribulations and losses and fear in order for me to be tested? And why should I be tested? Why can't I just be given? Well, the basic premise of intelligence is self-recognition. And in the relative world, it's impossible to recognize things until there's an antithesis to it. You need opposites to understand what you have. And that's just the nature of God's creation. Unless you and I are absolute, which is impossible, only Allah is absolute, one who has no frame, then we have to be within that realm of opposites. And in the realm of opposites, it's actually a blessing because it enables us to differentiate ourselves and gives us the opportunity, therefore, to elevate our own standards through this trial system. So Allah is testing us simply for us to recognize how blessed we are. It's as simple as that. It is for us to recognize... If you look at how we came into existence, we didn't know our own existence because we were nothing before. When we became existent, we inherited a blessing. And when we inherited it, we did not know whether we inherited it, and we did not know how we inherited it, and we did not know why we inherited it, and we did not know what is the reason for this inheritance, and we don't know what we need to do with the inheritance. And therefore, only through the systems of trials and struggle and tribulations do we recognize that value, and we all know that. Look, the best friends we have are the friends that were with us in difficult times not with us in good times. <coughs> friends that helped us in difficult times are typically the best friends we have. Unconditionally, it's the truth. Because what that does is it shows us that in the most difficult time, the one who helped us must be the best friend because that's the one who's willing to sacrifice the most in the most difficult of times. When we look at our prophets and imams, who are our best role models chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the reason we admire them and we are convinced that they are prophets of God is because they were the best in the most difficult of times. And the Qur'an constantly expresses that. You see, And that's why the dhikr of these prophets is so essential for our trajectory towards Allah. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مُوسَى Do dhikr in the book about Musa. When you do dhikr of prophets, you don't worship them. What it means is you remember them as examples on how they succeeded and why they are your best role models because the ones who succeed in trials and tribulations are the best human beings. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah says, you know, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةً قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ أُولَئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ Now when you examine this verse, Allah says, We will test you with fear, loss of life, loss of fruits. All the negatives you and I can imagine come under these trials and tribulations. Allah says, Give the good news to the patient ones. وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Give the good news. Who are the patient ones? Patience has a direct correlation to long-term long vision. And long-term vision requires an understanding of the origin and purpose of life. So sabirin are the ones who have long-term vision. You can't have sabr if you have short-term vision. It doesn't work. You must have long-term vision. And long-term vision in its highest form must incorporate Day of Judgment. Because that is the true definition of long-term vision, is Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Without it, you don't have long-term vision. And when you have long-term vision, and you understand the purpose of life, you develop sabr. Because sabr now gives you the capacity to understand the ultimate destiny, which means that all these trials and tribulations are little movements, but they're really, it's like in a plane, when you get a little turbulence, you don't jump off the plane. You know that it's going to land. It's just a little bumpy. Life is a little bumpy. It'll all end up good. If you know what you're doing. Long-term vision. So Allah says, They are the ones when trials come to them, they say, 
We are from Allah and we return to Him. What is that? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. In a practical world, it means the ultimate good is where we came from and the ultimate good is where we are returning. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. What it does is it pacifies me. It makes me very strong and firm. And when we look at Karbala, for example, where our blessed Imam is being butchered, his family is being butchered, he looks up and says, Ridham mi qada, wa tasliman li amri. We are satisfied by your decree, and we submit willfully to your decree. See? How do you satisfy? There's death, carnage, loss of life. It's, it is the most intense loss. Ridham mi qada, wa tasliman li amri. Allah says, you see, that's why he is your best role model. That's why we chose them. So the question you and I need to ask in this blessed month of Ramadan is how do we become one of those chosen? Because we have the capacity to, de to decree our own destiny by the choices we make. And I say this unconditionally, we are not spectators in religion. Prophets and Imams do not come in the arena to perform while we watch them and cheer them. We are in the arena too. This notion that Prophets and Imams are our leaders and may Allah give them strength to do what they need to do and while we watch them. This is furthest from the truth. What is true is we are in the arena with them we're in the battle, they are the commanders, and we also have the defense mechanisms. And if we don't defend ourselves, we get killed. It's as simple as that. So the blessed month of Ramadan is this month which Allah enables us and helps us to achieve victory in status and to become a chosen being. So Allah says, Shahru Ramadan, الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان. This is very elegant. Blessed month of Ramadan. In it, the Quran was revealed. We will discuss the Quran in these nine nights. The essence of the Quran, because as Muslims, it's essential for us to understand the written doctrine. You know the principles, the scripture, the guiding light. Any successful corporation has written documents that delineates its vision, that delineates its guidance system, protocols on doing what must be done, knows what to do and what not to do. The prescription. In هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم. See? وَيُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا كَبِيرًا This Qur'an, this book guides you to that which is most upright and give good news to those who do good that they will have a great reward. أَجْرًا كَبِيرًا And this month is when the Qur'an was revealed. We need to know as Muslims, how was the Qur'an revealed? What is the gist? of the Qur'an. We often think that the only way I know the Qur'an is if I memorize it and I know the every nuance of it. No, you don't. You need to know the essence of the Qur'an. You need to know what is the principle of the Qur'an. You need to know why was it revealed and what does it represent. Is it a storybook? Is it a book that shows me miracles? Is it a book that foretells the future and the past? What is its strength? Why is it different from other scriptures? How do I know my book is better than all? Maybe there's a better book out there. At the end of the day, whatever is best is what we should take. If I give you good and I give you better, you must take better. Though good is good. There are many good things out there, relatively, that are also bad. But this book is the best, hands down. And I don't say it because I'm a Muslim. I say it because it's the best and therefore I'm the Muslim. Okay? And we must know it. We must articulate it. We live in a non-Muslim audience. 
Even if we lived in a Muslim audience, we must articulate it. And when people ask us, why are you Muslim? What's your book like? You must have sufficient knowledge with which to articulate succinct messages to the audiences around us so that we impact our environment positively. But if we ourselves have no convictions, or we have limited convictions, then we cannot be good ambassadors. And leave the ambassadorship alone. What happens to us on Judgment Day? We get what we earn. We had the capacity to be ambassadors. We had the capacity to be neighbors of prophets and imams. We had the capacity to be the ultimate chosen beings. Shame on us if we don't take it when we have it. This is what it's all about. Each and every one of us in this room and on earth has that capacity. And shame on us if we don't take it. There's one thing not to have it. There's another to have it and not to take it. You and I are in the latter, not the former. Shame on us if we don't take it. And how much mercy Allah has given us. Shahrul Ramadan, Allah unzil fi al-Qur'an, hudan lin-nas. It's a guidance for mankind. Not for you and me as Muslims. Hudan lin-nas. When people ask me this book, it's the Muslim book, I said no. It's the book for humanity. It's the book for all creatures in the universe. Really? It's that universal? I said, yes. You can read it, I can read it. It affects all of us. It's not written for Muslims. It's written for all creation. And if the animals could read it, it suffices for them too. For it also offers them relief. وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ رَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا what we have revealed in the Qur'an is an elixir, is a shifa'a, it is a guidance, something that will light you up and give you happiness. Shifa'a wa rahma, mercy. And it does nothing to the, to the evildoers but destruction. That's good, it's a positive statement. وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا If you read this last verse, it's a positive, because there are two negatives in it. وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ ظَالِمِينَ is negative. خَسَارَ is negative. Put the two negatives. What the Qur'an is saying is we kill the cancer. We destroy the disease. We plug the ugliness. Isn't that beautiful? Look at it. Think about that. And the Qur'an was revealed in this month. It's a guidance for mankind. هُدَنْ لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتِ بَيِّنَاتِ Meaning... Evidential, clear proof. See? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us you need to use your mind, you need to understand, and you need to reflect. And you and I have that capacity. But here how the antithesis works. When children are born, they are a clean slate. And research has been done to show, even Harvard has shown that when children are infants are born, They've done tests to see what is their moral nature. Are children a blank slate, the way David Hume, the atheist, says? Or do they already have a pre-programmed moral system built to love good and despise evil? This was the research done at Harvard. And categorically, unequivocally, the research shows that infants are born with a preconceived set of parameters that they have an affinity, a direction that they love, which is good, and they despise evil. Meaning they love haq, they despise battle. <coughs> Babies, instant, born within a few days, a few hours, literally. So that research shows, besides all the rest, that even in the womb, this child is already understanding its parameters. When Allah says, وَنَفْسِمْ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا By the self which we created, Allah says, and He perfected it. وَنَفْسِمْ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا And He made it complete. سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا And taught it wrong and right. You and I, all human beings on earth, six billion plus, 
right? Seven billion plus. We all have the template of right and wrong. That's a must, that's a requirement to exist on this earth. We all have it. So when we see evildoers, we must not say that they were genetically predisposed to evil. The Mu'awiyahs and the Yazids and the Saddams of the modern time were not predisposed genetically to evilness. Categorically unacceptable. That would defy the mercy and the justice of God. For then we would argue that Shaitan, Iblis, was also predisposed genetically to be an evil creature. When in fact that's not the case. Because the Quran, Allah says, الَّذِي أَحْسَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَ Whatever Allah creates is good. There is no evil in Allah's creation. Therefore, it's impossible for any creation to be predisposed to evilness. That means those who have become evil have become evil due to the choices they have made and what is left, therefore, is the environment. It's the environment that has affected the individuals towards evilness. And when we are reckless in our misbehaviors, you see, when we are misbehaving and we are reckless in our obligations and the purpose of life and we live with short-term visions, happy-go-lucky, living for the day, as we say, forgetting the purpose of life and forgetting our obligations for what we need to do for tomorrow, we cause damage on others, which leads to this kind of a decline in society which leads every so often to the rise of tyrancy. And tyrants come and they cause havoc on earth and destruction. And then we all become victims of it, having to now clear out this cancer. How do we stop that? Constant vigilance of good behavior, which then leads to the elimination of evil. What it means is it's in the control of evil. Now you may be asking, why did Allah allow such evil to exist? I will go back to my original point. Allah creates a system that has opposites. Subhanalladhi khalaqal azwaja kullaha mimma tumbitul ard. Blessed is he who creates everything in pairs. Even the system of Allah is in pairs. It has pros and cons, thesis, antithesis. And therefore Allah has allowed that to exist. So evil exists. It is a good existence with one condition, we must avoid it. Its existence is essential. We must not eradicate the existence of the potential of evil. We must simply avoid it. We must prevent it. Its existence is imminent. It cannot be eliminated. So the Qur'an is a system that guides me on how to avoid evil and how to promote good. And therefore Allah says, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ You are the best in the community. You promote good. You forbid evil. And you believe in God. Why Allah? Because Allah is the ultimate source of good in the prevention of evil. Otherwise, there's no purpose in life. You see, I can be very utilitarian, as one would say in English, meaning that I can be a good person just for the worldly good, so that the good ultimately comes back to me in a very utilitarian fashion. But that is short-term vision. It's positive to some degree, but it is actually holistically negative. Because short-term vision is simply negative without long-term vision. Short-term vision is very positive if it is within the system of long-term visions. So we must have short-term visions, but it is hopeless if there is no long-term vision. And you look at the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, Alif Lam Mim Thalik Al-Kitab La Rayba Fihi Hudan Lil Muttaqeen Alladheena Yu'minuna Lil Ghayb You see? The same ayah Allah says, And in the day of judgment, in the hereafter, they are certain, meaning to be muttaqi, to have taqwa, you do your short-term vision, which is salah, charity, 
You give charity, short term, but pegged with long term. And in the day of judgment, in the hereafter, they have certainty. So when you and I have certainty in long term vision, which requires reflection, cogitation, which requires thinking, meditation, asking the question, why do things work the way they do? Why did this trial and tribulation come to me? Every one of us in this room has a trial and a tribulation. Every one of us in this room has a problem. Hands down. And you and I question that. Why Allah is giving me this trial? What wrong did I do? Why did I go bankrupt? Why do I have this disease? What bala is this? What wrong did I do? We always ask that question. That's a legitimate question to ask. But often we will answer it properly if we have the long-term vision and the realization that such trials and tribulations must have come to me because God loves me. Rather than saying, what wrong did I do? That question, what wrong did I do, should be asked every day, every hour. Not when a trial comes to us. We should always be vigilant with our realization that what wrong am I doing? We should always check ourselves and never consider ourselves paradise bound without struggle. Paradise is a gift of Allah. And inshallah we will get it. We were created for paradise. Promise, promise. We were created for paradise. We were not created for hell. Allah despises hell. And he tells us to avoid it. Ya ladina amanu qū anfusakum wa ahlikum nar. You see? Wa qūduha nas wal hijar. All you who believe, save yourselves and your family from the fire. From the fire. Allah despises you. But I must say that to enter hell requires hard work. It's difficult to enter hell. You have to work hard to get to hell. You might say, wait, no, no, no. Brother, it's paradise that's difficult, not hell. I said, no, it's easy to enter paradise. Promise, it's easy. It's hard to enter hell. People who will enter the lowest levels of hell, study them. They worked hard. Muawiyah was working very hard. Amr bin As, who helped Muawiyah become who he did, worked very hard. Sleepless nights, battles. They stole, they cheated, they lied. They were pathological liars. They worked hard. If you could test their frontal lobe, it was bright red. They worked very hard. And they didn't let go. Allah said, وَمَا يَجْهَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا no one denies our signs except this perfidious rejecter, one who works hard. Now you might feel like, wow, there's hope for me to enter paradise. <laughs> because if it's that difficult to get into hell, alhamdulillah, I'm not going to enter hell. You know, the sad thing is, you ever see people who are very unhealthy due to their excessiveness in eating or laziness? Ask them, how did you get this? bad shape. They never realized how they got there. They just kept eating the Mac burgers and stuffing all the calories. And at the moment they looked in the mirror, it didn't look so bad. But it gradually took them over. And it was so benign, they didn't catch the change. Only over a span of time did they realize that the belly was hanging close to the floor. Ask them, how'd you get that? Did it happen in an hour? No. It was very gradual. And quite the flip, if you want to get in shape, it's very gradual. Most of us have no patience for that. We go to the gym, we hit the machines, we work out, we put a sweat, we feel we've got, we earned it, we go and eat a lot of food. I earned it! But you never get in shape. I've seen people in the gym for years, they look the same. <laughs> you wonder why they're still looking the same? Because they have a contradiction. They're conflicting the system, but it's gradual. 
They must be countering it with too much, something else is counterbalancing. For you to purify, you need to have a trajectory and you need to be patient. And quite the reverse, that when we are reckless and forgetful with the ghafla, our iman ways moves so far away, we start to become wretched creatures. Then when shaitan offers us something that is destructive for other human beings, we gladly take it. When you study the actions of Muawiyah, Yazid, Abu Sufyan, in the modern day tyrants, you'll see the same characteristic. They are constantly oblivious of their duty, which then leads them away from haq, and they become masters of battle. God forbid you and I are in that situation. Thank God Allah gave us these blessed months of Ramadan to check us. It's almost like a quarterly meeting in your business. We want to know the status of our profitability in the company. Where do we stand in the arena of economics? <coughs> Ramadan is that. It's the month of reflection. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu kutiba alaykum asiyam kama kutiba ala alladina min qablikum la'allakum tattakum. All believers, we have enjoined upon you fasting like it was enjoined on your predecessors so that you may achieve God consciousness. What is God consciousness? That awareness, that vision, that long-term vision of why you were created and why it is so essential and important to maintain a trajectory of good behavior and purity because you were created for paradise and not hell. And lest you forget that and become a wretched creature that contributes to the destruction of the human race, which will then lead you to enter hell. So I want you to understand, Islam is a religion of mercy. It's not a religion of damnation and what we call uh, sending people to hell. It's not. It's not a religion of punishment. People misunderstand it. They think Islam is draconian. They think Islam is so rigid. It doesn't allow you flexibility. They think Islam is so rigid that women have to walk behind men, which is nonsense or the hijab, which is somehow some kind of an injunction of the man, man, you know, the male gender, or God's, Allah's injunction on women as second class creations that have to now be held back with the hijab, prohibitive, inhibitive, when in fact it's precisely the opposite. It's actually the promotion of freedom the protection of dignity and morality, that humankind flips it to try to validate its desire to be a wild beast. Hmm? Allah says, right? In the nafsa la ammaratun bisu illa ma rahima rabbi. Yourself has a desire to deviate due to your ignorance, Allah is alluding to in this ayah. In the nafsa la ammaratun bisu. You have this desire. But if you ask that same human being, what do you really want? The human being categorically will tell you, I want perfection. There is not a single human being who denies perfection. Hands down. Even an alcoholic will tell you it's wrong to drink. But they're stuck in a hole. And they can't get out. Why? because they don't see light at the end of the tunnel and therefore they have no reason to get out of the hole. That vision of dhikr, I tell you nothing animates us more than to see light at the end of the tunnel. And if we don't see light, we won't be animated to move. We will not be vigilant, nor will we be proactive. We may be reactive only because our comfort zones are being threatened, but we will lose hope because we don't see light at the end of the tunnel, when in fact we are born with light at the end of the tunnel. For our trajectory in thought is that I was created when I don't deserve to exist. And every creature that I see has a goal. Even the insects that I see crawling on the streets or in my 
spaces have a direction. They go someplace. They carry something. And they are fashioned to do something. Even looking under the microscope, you see the paramecium or the amoeba moving. It's got a direction. It knows what it wants to do. You go inside the paramecium. You go inside the amoeba and go and study the organelles and you see each one has a direction. The uh, mitochondria has a direction. It knows what to do. Every piece of this cell knows what to do. Allah is saying, كُلَّ يَوْمٍ هُوَ فِي شَأْن فَبِأَيَّ عَلَىٰءِ رَبِّكُمَا تَكَذِّبًا Every day there is my sign. Which of my bounties do you rely on for? For you and I to say that there is no light at the end of the tunnel, we are myopic, foolish individuals. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I'm honored to be here in Manchester at IUS. I'm honored to have you present. I'm honored to be in your presence. I'm honored to be in the blessed month of Ramadan. And I hope that in these few nights that we spend together, we will invigorate each other spiritually to adapt and readapt and realign our <coughs> actions and transactions to hopefully be more proactive and positive. And on that note, I say to you, my respected sisters and brothers in Islam, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed month that we become spiritual, that we become caring and sharing, and that we give up the mundane nonsense things that we do that takes away from the good that we can potentially do. I pray that we become more God conscious. I pray that we become more prayerful. Allah loves the prayerful ones. And often when we pray, we find it to be a rote exercise, repetitious exercise. It becomes repetitious if we have no vision in it. But if you ask a basketball player, you know, one time I was watching some NBA basketball players practice, you know, tall seven foot guys, and they kept throwing the ball. And each time they get the ball, it's just, it's automatic. Bounce the ball, toss. Bounce the ball, toss. And I sat there watching and I said, he's already done it, why is he doing it again? And doesn't he get tired? I mean, he's probably thrown that ball hundreds of thousands of times. Isn't he tired? And he keeps doing it and doing it. You know, and then when they get off the court, you know, even while they're sitting, walking, they, they're doing, they're bouncing, you know. Imagining that the ball is in their hand. Why are they doing it? What do you think they're doing it for? They're doing it because they have a vision. They have a vision of being number one. They have a vision of scoring the best. They have a vision of achieving the highest possible position in the industry. With that light in mind, you never get tired of tossing the ball. Never. In fact, you do it so often, you do it in your sleep. So why do we get tired of praying? Because we don't have vision. We think it's just an exercise. And we say, God, you already heard me praying to you yesterday. Do you need to hear it again? I mean, I already talked to you. I mean, don't you think it's redundant for me to repeat it? But subhanAllah, when you have a vision, of saying, no, this prayer is a movement to its perfection, you never get tired of praying. You see, there's a difference in the approach. And the reason there's a difference in that approach is the vision. The ones who have the least amount of vision typically in prayer are who? Children. Typically, prayer to them is just an exercise. And they'll do it because the father does it, father does it, mom does it, you know. Or the friends do it, they'll do it, which is good. But typically children, when they pray, they don't have the insight nor the foresight as to why they're praying. But if we engage them early on, including fasting, and they look up to us, it's amazing. You know, when I walk through the Hasidic communities, you know how the 
a very ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Jewish community have ringlets and they wear their hats and their coats and their garbs and they carry their, their amulets and whatever they worship with. And then you see this little kid, six-year-old, wearing the coat and the hat and the ringlet. And you wonder, like, why, well, this is like a miniature copy of the big one. And he's following the dad. And he's no compunction. He's so doing it like a classic Hasidic Jew. He needs to be that. And I said, look, this child does it with no reservations because that's the environment he's in. And you grow up in that environment. So is there anything wrong with that child having ringlets? No, because he is of that community. He is following the pathway of his adult. But look at that child. He has no reservation. He sees other kids with no ringlets. He doesn't care. He's walking around with his ringlets. He's happy. I said, see, that's human nature. Why don't we as Muslims take our children and put them in the regulations of Islam the way the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us? And when our children are indulging in fasting, even short-term fasting, where they fast maybe half a day if they can fast the whole day, eventually it becomes a full day. And then you reward them, you laud them, you, uh, you appreciate them. Not excessive appreciation, just the right amount. Because you too much appreciation kills them. You appreciate them just enough, and you give them a carrot and make them to do more. Why? Because it's good for them. When parents ask you, why do you... So many parents say, my child fasts, he may die. <laughs> said, really? For your information, your child has more resiliency in fasting than an adult. Children are better survivors in fasting than adults. Because their bodies are more adaptive to the environment. Even children who go through accidents and lose half a brain, half their brain is damaged, they develop full functions in the other half. That's how adaptive children are. That's how strong children are. We must not underestimate the power of children. But if we inculcate early on such good behaviors, then that tree will naturally grow in a direction that requires less maintenance tomorrow. Today we raise our children in such ways that we ignore them and we wait for them to turn 15 as males by the hour and then we declare Islam to them and make them baligh. Imagine you're 15 and now suddenly you're introduced, oh, by the way, there's Islam and you're going to pray. Huh? What's that? Never heard of that before. Really? Now, of course, I'm being facetious here. I'm exaggerating a bit. But generally, we have this lifestyle where our children are ignored from the general duties and responsibilities and then we introduce it to them at a very later stage not realizing that for 14 years they've been adapted to something very different from this whereas if we introduce our children at early ages and put them in that momentum which is towards the good but we also validate the good so that children love to do it see there's we must not be prohibitive and restrictive when we enforce our children to fast and pray. We should make it pleasant, pleasurable. Many times I ask children, because I deal with kids all the time, do you pray? I said, yes. Here's a young boy like that. How old are you, brother? Nine. Nine. If I ask a nine-year-old boy, do you pray? Do you pray? Yes. Okay. I'm not going to ask you the next question. <laughs> Why do you pray? I can pretty much say, because I've had so much experience. If I first one they'll say is, my parents told me to pray. And tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Secondly, I go to hell if I don't pray. God will throw me in hell. Typical answer. Is that why you pray? There you go. Another confirmation, he agrees. So, typically when we ask children, now, the way we present it to our children is, son, daughter, if you don't pray, God will throw you in hell. Do you want to hell? I don't want to hell. Mom, what's hell like? <laughs> it's hot. 
Everything melts, you burn, painful. Oh, I can't take that. Yeah, you better pray. Quickly, give me the tulba. Give me the musalla. Let me go pray. And then every time it's prayer time, I better go pray. MashaAllah, you're so prayerful. Yes, I'm scared about <laughs> This notion is okay, but it's exaggerated. Having fear of hell is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam says something very beautiful. Salatu alayhi wa sallam. He says, a good friend is one who reminds you of the mercy of Allah and reminds you of the fear of one's own evils and reminds you of Allah all the time. Meaning a good friend reminds you of the enormous mercy that awaits for you, but they also remind you of the potential dangers and encapsulates the whole idea about how to love Allah. That's a good friend. But we often raise our children with fear, 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 fear. And sadly, many a times even pulpits are used as instruments of disseminating fear to the crowds. Fear, you better, you're going to suffer, burn, help. So what happens then is the resonance that we leave with in these institutions is negative. And often, you'll find, for example, I can see this with due respect to Christianity. When you look at the right-wing Christians, their theme is fear. As much as it's plastered on the front that Jesus loves you and God loves you, it's the real machinery of the right-wing Christians is fear. Fear, paranoia. You're damned at birth. And you're doomed. And only Christ can save you. You start with damnation followed by salvation. In Islam, you start with salvation. And Islam warns you of damnation. You will notice in Islam, everybody starts with salvation. So if you read the Quran, when we read the Quran, you will see nothing but rahmah. Rahma, 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 mercy, mercy, mercy. But every once in a while, the Quran warns us of the rejection of mercy, which then leads to destruction. So when we raise our children, and when we institute these kinds of programs, we must insist on the true nature of the Quran, which is positive, motivational thinking, with light at the end of the tunnel, with the enormous appreciation of Allah's infinite mercy, now, past, and in the future, at all times, and that we must take full advantage of it to reach the higher levels of existence. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali. Now, when you say to a child, pray, children will pray. Because they want to imitate you. But over time, and children reach 9, 10 years of age, you start to give them autonomy. Boys, sis, girls, 6, 7, they start getting autonomous. If we don't articulate as parents a good relationship in explaining to our children the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to teach our children to fall in love with Allah, there will be no light at the end of the time. My brothers and sisters, I say this to you sincerely. I travel the globe by Allah's grace. I meet thousands of people. I speak in some of the most prestigious universities in the world. Nothing to bask in, but oh wow. I'm just giving you a reason. I was just at Harvard, I spoke at Harvard. And you see so much apathy in religion. You see agnosticism is prevalent. Lack of trust in God. Lack of trust in the system, fear. There's this ominous feeling like, oh, I don't know. Too much damnation, too much destruction. Where is God? You hear this, you feel it. And those who are clutching on to Allah are doing it because they're afraid. So therefore, we're just reactionary. We're not thinking positively. What can we do to establish great systems that will solve 
the problems of today and prevent the problems of the future. We don't think that way. It is the result, the net result of continuous negative thinking. It is the net result of seeing the cup as half empty. And it leads to apathy. And often people come and ask me that question. You know when atheists say to me, how do you know God exists? I say, I exist. That's evidence enough. Because from nothing comes nothing. And I have a purpose. Then why are you asking me this question? If such a being didn't exist, why are you asking me this question? Well, there should be no reason for you to ask me. Because if we're all accidental, then you shouldn't be asking me purposeful questions. Nor should you be expecting a purposeful answer. It's built into the system, isn't it? And Allah says, look how close I am to you. Look at that, how... And by the way, I look at that atheist asking me the question, I said, tell me about your life. He says, well, I've got pain, my wife died, my father died, my mother died, people are getting killed. I said, aha, uh -huh, that's the reason. Your net result has been so negative, you've come to this conclusion, where is God? Now, it comes in here, too. It comes in our Islamic forums, too. That if we do not impart positive understanding, light at the end of the tunnel, long-term vision, if we do not articulate them clearly in a pragmatic, practical fashion day to day, we will not achieve success. Promise. These are the core principles of pragmatic transactions of the day that takes us out of khasara. Otherwise, we're going to dip into this well and never get out. But we were created to glide towards paradise through trials and tribulations, yes. But listen to this ayah, this same ayah that I recited today, Surah Al-Baqarah, right? Verse 185. Allah says, bikum al yusra, wa la bikum al Think about it. Allah desires to make it easy. He doesn't desire to make it difficult. So you might say, but brother, you told us you will test us with trials and tribulations. Isn't that difficulty? No, it's not difficult if you and I are ready for it. When fighters go, like, you know, defensive fighters, when they go to fight, they prepare themselves. And if they were so well prepared, no matter how difficult the trial came, they conquered it. So it's not about difficulty, it's about the preparation and the ease. And I must say, if you and I work together as a society, the bala will even reduce. They might say, but if the bala reduces, how am I being tested? Under those conditions, you will see that we will take ourselves to higher levels of bala, meaning the trials will come at a different level. But it will be such high level bala that you and I will be able to take care of it. And remember, Allah says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not put taklif on a single self except that which it can handle. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. So don't worry. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to test us, when He does test us, guaranteed it meets the capacity. Guaranteed. So Allah guarantees that you will be able to handle it. The question is, are we willing to take on the battle? Are we willing to take on the fight? This is the question. So when we teach our children to pray, the simple method that strengthens us, that enables us to fight the battles even better, and to avoid apathy in salah, avoid apathy in deen, avoid apathy in belief in Allah, in dhikr, and it strengthens us naturally, where the world will be wondering, like, how come you have such zeal and such passion and such compassion to do good on this earth? How is it that you have this ability? You say, it's easy. Easy. It's so difficult. Go ask the one with a high IQ how easy it is for them to pass an exam. You ask them, how is it easy? Well, Allah gave it to this person. And guess what? Allah gave us all strength. Whether it's IQ, or it's physical, or mental, every one of us has been gifted. 
Every one of us has that capacity. So don't ever say that I am a failure or I am what we call damaged goods. No. No one is damaged goods. Even Pharaoh didn't think he was damaged goods because he prayed to Allah while he was drowning. If you and I think we're damaged goods, then don't pray to Allah. Allah says, you are never damaged goods because even when you are about to drown in the ocean, you will turn to me, Allah says. When that mawj is covering you, you will turn to God. Allah says, they turn to Allah with sincerity. Because, why do we turn to Allah? Because deep down we know we're not damaged goods. So why do we turn to Allah when those dire situation comes? Why don't we turn to Him when the dire situation hasn't come? Isn't that superior? This month of Ramadan is that. It's a helper. London, here, I know you fast for 20 hours. This debate now. Should we shorten the fasting? It's difficult, 20 hours. A task, it's a burden. Allah is merciful. There's got to be a legal loophole somewhere. <laughs> We've got to find the sunset earlier someplace. And if it means using another country. Whatever the case, at the end of the day, whether you fast for 20 hours or you fast for 5 hours a day, some places you fast for 5 hours a day, Allah is merciful, the earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, which makes it that every 18 years you go through some sufferings and then 18 years you go through a lot of pleasure. <laughs> but we forgot the pleasure that we've had for 18 years. So now we're complaining with this difficulty. But regardless of that, whether we want to fast for 20 hours or we want to get on a plane and go out and go to some you know, shorter distance place where we don't have to fast as long, that's up to us. Allah didn't forbid us. We can do it. Go ahead. The point is, whether it's, let's look at the situation here, 20 hours. It's all in the mind. And I truly believe that if we put our mind to it, 20 hours is nothing. It's all up here. Trust me, you ask a yogi, you know, they stop breathing for a while and their heartbeat slows down. How do you do that? It's not difficult. I train my mind to do it. It's the power of training and you don't need to be a Muslim to do that. It's dormant in all of us. We have that capacity. The problem is we often don't use it because we're so distracted with mundane deeds and gossip and rubbish things we do in life. We have no time to dig into our treasuries that we possess. So fasting, Allah says, I've given it to you as an exercise to say no to evil. You know, when I was a teenager, it was very hot in the summer and I used to teach tennis. And nothing was more precious than ice water. I'm on the tennis court, I, I would not advise you to do this. You know, you get dehydrated very quickly. But I used to do it. Five, six hours a day, I was on the court training. I was making good money, so it was non-negotiable there. And I was staying training and, and the heat. And all my friends used to say, some water, I said, no. What are you doing? I'm fasting. Come on, that's suicide. That's crazy. How do you do it? I said, no, it's not difficult for me at all. I like it. I enjoy it. And I used to enjoy it. Of course, until the moment when I broke my fast, then you really enjoy it. But the point is, it's all in the mind. If you convince yourself about something, the body reacts to it. And I'll talk about the power of the environment even at our cellular level. <coughs> the power of the environment that affects even how our intricate cell and the organisms within the cell reacts to. Just when we think. And how we think and what we say and what we do affects even our cellular levels. And I'll discuss it, inshallah, with evidence. But today, let's end this presentation with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us the opportunity in this blessed month to understand the Qur'an better. Our hearts, hopefully, will be more receptive and pliant, that we become more submissive and humble, we become more generous in giving and letting go of our love for the material world, just for the world. 
and that we become caring and sharing for those who are in need of help today as we speak, like while we're comfortable here, air-conditioned rooms, beautiful facilities. There are children displaced in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Pakistan, in Palestine, in all these countries where war is right now so prevalent. And there are children right now who are displaced, who are orphans, mothers and fathers not knowing where to go. In Africa, so much mayhem is taking place. We must care for them. You might say, but what will it do for them? Allah says, if you care sufficiently, something good will come out of you, which will save a potential life. But the ultimate beneficiary is you. Because when you do that dhikr of caring and sharing, you will notice your heart will become more pliant. You, will, you and I will do less ghibah. You and I will commit less sins. You and I will work harder and to achieve more success in our businesses so that we can help more. It's all nothing but positive. Let us teach our children positive relations. Let us teach ourselves positive relations. We will talk about loving Allah. When we fall in love with Allah, you know, if you ever see a smile in a person, those biggest smiles, the most happy smiles is when they're usually in love. In love with other human beings. The greatest smile is when you're in love with Allah. When you're in love with Allah, you just naturally love the human race. You just naturally love the animals. You naturally love the ecosystem. You love the universe. Don't you and I want to love? Without a doubt. There is no greater means to love than to love Allah. But to love Him, you and I must recognize Him. And there's no way for recognizing Him but through His creation, which is the rahmah and the beneficence He has given us. In this month of Ramadan, let us hope that while we are abstaining from eating, every time we say, ah, 20 hours, say, no, alhamdulillah, 20 hours. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma inna nagrabu ilayka fi dawlatin kareema tu'azzu biha al-Islam wa ahla wa tudhillu biha al-nifaq wa ahla wa taj'alna fiha min al-du'ati ila ta'atik wa qadati ila sabili wa tarzukuna biha كرامة الدنيا والآخرة وآخر الدعوة أن الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته